Hi, I'm Lana Kelly, writer and photographer, and this is Hudson Valley Art Speak. And um, today I'm going to introduce you to Bob Madden, who's a sculptor, a stone sculptor. And the first time I ever met Bob, I drove up, up his driveway, and it was a beautiful sunny day, and he was there working on a piece with a, 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 a power saw, and, and he had a respirator on, and he was just in a halo of uh, marble dust with the light reflecting off, and it really looked very wonderful. It kind of looked like an angel. <laughs> yeah, like an angel. Um, thanks for coming tonight, Bob. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, so how long have you been doing this, um, and, and how, how long did it take to become proficient at, at cutting stone? Well, I, I really don't know that I'm proficient even yet, <sighs> but I have been working with stone on and off for probably 30 years. I think I really focused on the, the artistic element of it over the last seven to 10 years, where I would take a, a block of stone and, and try to make it look like something, try to make it come out to be something that people would look at and go, wow, as opposed to, where did you dig that up? <laughs> so I haven't been doing it that long. And what I found at first was that I didn't know enough about the stone itself. The stone, the stone has, it's been laying in the earth for years and years and years, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years. It develops small cracks and fractures. And if you try to make it do something that it, it can't do, you end up getting pretty frustrated. So it took me a while to learn how to find those flaws before I started cutting it so that I could end up with a product that I would, would get to the, the final form that I was looking for. So you can take a flawed stone and work around the flaw I can. I, you know, it's, it's, sometimes there's a, a flaw buried deep inside it that I don't find until I've actually worked it a while. And that can be kind of frustrating to spend a lot of time and energy on something, get it to what you think is going to be the final form, only to have it start to separate. It starts to crack. When that happens, you have to be flexible. You have to be artistic. You have to then take that and look at it from a new point of view and decide, can I turn it into something else? You know, I remember a, a a fairly funny uh, skit that Bill Cosby did, talking about going to summer camp and making ashtrays. Everything turned out looking like ashtrays. <laughs> well, when I start, I have a specific idea in mind, and if a piece falls off, then it might become something else. And if that piece falls off, it might become something else again. Ultimately, I might end up with an ashtray. Right. <laughs> but it's, it's the process of learning the stone, figuring out how to get from where it is to where I want it to be. That's, that's the, the journey that I'm on. That's what I'm trying to figure out how to do. And where do you get your material? Well, I've, for the most part, I get most of my, uh, I, I work almost exclusively in marble. And I go to a, a quarry up in Rutland, and they're very gracious about letting me wander around and find what I need from them there. Sometimes there's scrap that they'll let me take for free. Other times it's a, a nominal charge. It's, marble is, is generally sold per pound. If you buy it from a, uh, a stone supplier, it's anywhere from a dollar and a half to as much as three or even four dollars a pound. Depends on where the stone originates. Carrera marble, for example, very expensive because it has to be shipped over from Italy and it's at the higher end of the range. It's a much cleaner, uh, purer marble. It doesn't have as, as many, uh, it's, it's virtually pure white. So you'll find a lot of figurative stone sculptors will work in that because the last thing they want to do is, is start making a, a figure of a face or a, a hand or something and suddenly there's there's brown dots on it or stripes or, a or something. Or streak or something, right. yeah. But you can see that this this marble, this is from, from Rutland, uh -huh. this has gray streaks running through it, but it adds to the character of what I was trying to achieve. If I wanted to do something that was a little more uh, figurative, then I would end up having to purchase from, from a stone supplier. I've also gotten it from, um, I'm sorry, it just, just popped out of my yeah. mind for a minute. I've also bought stone from Tennessee, pink marble, that I turned into a, uh, a, don um, a charitable contribution to, I, I created a pink ribbon out of the stone and donated it to a charity that's fighting breast cancer. That's great. So that's great. again, depending on what kind of stone I'm looking for, I may have to buy it, I may be able to get it for free. This piece over here, this black and white piece, these floor tiles that I had carved up into sections, epoxied them together, and then spent time shaping them and, and sanding them and smoothing them. So that's a, another example of where I might 
get my, my raw material yeah. from. Yeah. So, so you cut these to shape and then you stacked them and then you turned it or is that what you did? Essentially, sure. Yeah. I, I basically cut them into square shapes. I stacked them one on top of another, twisting them slightly as I go, but there's still a lot of raw, rough edges. And that's when the power tools come out and I start grinding the edges down and, right. and smoothing it, right. getting it to a point where it's relatively smooth. But then, then the handwork goes into place where I have to get out the, the, uh, the uh, sandpaper, the, the wet, dry sandpaper, and, and really smooth it down so that it's very nice to the touch, very soft, and, and feels like it has uh, almost a glass-like quality to it. And then you added the figure on top. Yeah, the little man on top because it, it, it's a pretty sterile looking thing when it's just a stack of black and white squares. But once I got that completed, it actually sat on my shelf for a long time because I really didn't have a plan for it. But a friend came over to the house and she was so fascinated by it. She wondered what I was going to do with it and that made me get more interested in it. And when I looked at it, the first thing that came to my mind was the Twilight Zone. Uh -huh. Remember that Rod Serling sure. entry where the, there's the black and white spinning thing? <laughs> That's what, that was the image that came into my mind. And so I, I got the sense of, you know, uncertainty and fear and, and concern. And so the little man has to be peering over the edge. I mean, he's, he's poised to just look straight over the edge into some cataclysmic event. And, and so his body posture had to be, you know, resistant to looking forward, kind of pulling back, but at the same time looking right. forward. Right. So that was the uh, that was the, the intent of the piece. And it, the piece is called Twisted Vision, uh -huh. and it's actually been received very well for a piece that I was just going to leave on my shelf and and, and let uh, molder there for a while. So tell me about this piece, this interlocking piece here that you have. Um, it's it looks so intricate with with four different interlocking rings. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, um, as I was telling somebody fairly recently, the secret. To, to doing these type of rings or these the square rings, something like this. Once you do it, the magic kind of goes out of it. It actually just becomes a chore to make these after you make the first For one. For you. For me. Yeah. It's, it, it's having the vision. I, of course, I didn't discover it. I was taught how to do this. But it's being taught that shape that you need to get to that you can carve the squares out of or in the case of these rings, these wedding rings, it's a very fundamental basic shape that you start with and then you hollow out everything that doesn't belong. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. You hear sculptors, <clears throat> excuse me, you hear sculptors talk about that all the time. When they look at the rock, they can see the, the ultimate design is in there. They just have to find a way to cut away all the pieces that don't belong. In the case of these rings, what I ended up trying or what I started with was a block that was relatively long and thin. So the, these outside rings defined, were defined by the shape of the block. Had the, had the block been kind of squarish like this, then the top and bottom would have been defined by these rings like that. Right. So it's finding a shape that'll work I know that makes a lot of noise. Yeah. It's, it's finding a shape that will work in the rock that you start out with, in the, in the block of stone that you have. So it's, as I've told you in my artist statement, it's kind of a negotiation between the artist and the material. It will only let me do so much. If there's a crack in there, right. I can't repair it. I can't fix it. If it's a certain size, I can't do much more with it. It's a negotiation. I have to figure out what it will let me do and then I have to have the skill to, to try to get it to the shape that I'm looking for. So, so, so when you purchase a block or get a block of, of marble, do you know when you go to the quarry what pieces you have in mind? Or does the marble, uh, you know, when you see the marble, it, it brings a piece to mind? Or which, how does it work? It works both ways. Okay. Sometimes I go in there with a very specific idea. I have a piece in mind that's going to be eight inches tall, six inches wide, and so forth. And so obviously I have to find the block that will do that. Other times, and I, I have a garage full of, of marble blocks and boulders, well, not boulders, probably <laughs> nothing bigger than uh, 12, 14 inches across. But I have a garage full of those. And sometimes I just go out and I look at them and sit and think, and an idea pops into my head based on the, on the fundamental shape of the stone. 
So it really does come from both directions. Sometimes it's the rock, sometimes it's me. So do you make larger pieces? I mean, what is your... I do. I, yeah. <clears throat> I have worked with um, some granite pieces. I've done landscape type function, or landscape design pieces. Yeah. Um, I've also purchased large slabs of marble for specific designs. Uh, I'm really limited by the equipment that I use. I mean, yeah. And by that I mean the equipment that I can use to move the stone. Marble is, is fairly heavy. A cubic foot of marble uh, yeah. is 155 pounds. Yeah. So the older I get, the smaller my pieces are going to be because <laughs> I just can't move them around anymore. <laughs> You're not going to go to the gym and work out to... Uh... This, this, is the best, yeah. this is the best I've got, Lon. I, I, can't, I, can't, uh, I can't do work with much more than about 150 to 200 pounds. Yeah. You, you told me about a really nice tradition with this, these pieces, the wedding rings. Tell me what you do with this with your family. For my family, when anybody gets married, I carve them a set of these wedding, what I call wedding rings. And there's a statement that goes along with them that speaks about rings having a, no beginning, no end, the interlocking feature of the rings being two people who come together and will be together for eternity. So I, I will carve the rings for them. I'll present them with this, this little statement about the wedding rings. And it's, it's just been very well received. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Um, where do you show your work? Well, I'm part of, uh, I'm part of the Tivoli Artists Co-op, which is changing its name to the Tivoli Artists Gallery, uh -huh. uh, effective in about a month or so. I am showing in a, in a gallery down in Long Island, on, in Southampton on Long Island. I've been in a number of juried shows in the local area. And of course our website, my, my wife and I work together. My wife Karen is a, a fiber artist. And between us, we are rock in a soft play studio. I'm rock, she's the soft play studio. Uh, we try to, to do uh, theme or uh, works, we each do individual works off of a common theme. So we might both do a work called Rogue Wave, for example, or Missing Pieces, or Horizon. She'll do it in fiber, I'll do it in stone, and we try to show those together. And all that work is, uh, is available on our website. It's interesting. It's, it's kind of like two opposite things that you and Karen do. It, it is. It is. It, she's, and, and what's also interesting, to me at least, is that she has the ability to introduce so much different color into her work, where I'm pretty much limited. I, I, I get my white marble, uh, right. I can get some black granite yeah. in there, but uh, it's hard for me to, to introduce color. I'm, I'm stuck with what I get. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think it looks pretty wonderful, though. Um, so um, you're going to be part of the Art East Open Studio Tour this year? I am, and I apologize. I should have mentioned that to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we, like, we really enjoy working with the uh, Art East artists because there are a lot of very clever people there. Mm -hmm. They show a lot of beautiful work. Yeah. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to have people come to our studio because, frankly, while showing in a gallery is nice and having that check fall out of the sky because somebody bought something is also nice, the best part is having somebody walk into your studio seeing a piece that you've worked really hard on and just falling in love with it. And, and not about whether or not they buy it, right. but just to know that you made that connection with somebody, that somebody gets it, that they, they see the world exactly as you do for that one moment in time. That's a very fulfilling experience. Yeah. And I, I know you must feel that as well with your photography and painting. It, it's great to have people and be able to talk to them on a one-to-one -one basis right. and, and kind of explain things or, or the story behind it. And, right. Why yeah, did you do that that way? Why is that piece that way? Why right. did you think of that? That's a, it's a right. fascinating opportunity. So I love being part of Art East. Right. It's great. It's a great opportunity. Um, could you just tell us what your website is so that um, people will be able to go to see it? I appreciate your twisting my arm. My website, <laughs> as I said, is my website with my wife, Karen Madden. It is www.rockandasoftplace.com. It's all one word. Rock, R-O-C-K-A-N-D-S-O-F-T-P-L-A-C-E. Com. Got it. And it's also, um, Bob has a page on the Art East Duchess website. And uh, thank you so much, Bob, for coming tonight and showing us your work and, and for being here with us in the studio. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. It's been great. Thanks. Mm -hmm.